What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Denaric Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnian Reacts 2 Early South Slavic History by, what's the channel name? M Laser History. Yeah, that's the one. Well, you can't see it because it's, you know, I cut the screen off just so it's a little easier on me to record videos, but for you guys, you know, it should be the exact same experience as always. Okay. Now, I wanted to do a video on, you know, the South Slavs or react to, to a video on the South Slavs for a while now because one, I'm a South Slav technically, two, I'm a history buff as well, three, uh, you know, South Slavic history, I, it's kind of obscure, not, not really uh, as uh, easily understandable as like English history or French history or, uh, you know, you get the point, or American history because a lot of the early South Slavic history is very obscure for an obvious reason, the South Slavs didn't really write things down. So what we know about them is due to other sources writing about them. Because of that, in, I'm bringing, I'm getting to my third reason why I'm doing a video on early Sla South Slavic history is uh, there's just so much uh, pseudo history going on in the in the Balkans about the. So some people believe that it didn't ever actually happen because there's no you know archaeological evidence again because South Slavs weren't really focused on building amazing uh, architecture and so they were focused on you know surviving and tilling the land rather than writing and that comes later on after they get more organized and uh, i always get the comments like oh no you believe the the the, the slavic uh, migration theory it never really happened i'm like what <laughs> how, how, how did and then i search up on the internet and you know i'm I'll, we'll get to the video soon but and then i search up on the internet uh you know proof that the south slavic migration never happened and all I get is one. I get I get confirmation that it did happen, as a matter of fact. And second of all, the, those websites claiming that uh, it never happened are obviously like nationalist websites. So, which talk just which are basically confirmation bias websites. Okay. Now, let's get into the video and find out more about the South Slavic history. Let's go. Before we start talking about the Slavic migration into the Balkans during the 5th and 6th century, we have to look at the area prior to their arrival. Most of the Balkans have always been kind of poorly settled due to its mountains and thick forests. The cities True. and towns that did exist were either by major inland routes or the sea. The towns below this line were largely Greek, whereas the towns above it had more mixed population. For example, the towns near the sea were very much Latin as opposed to the towns which were more inland. These probably still spoke Latin as it was the main trading language in the area, but they were mostly made up of Illyrian, Thracian, Dacian, and the remnants of some Germanic tribes. How Okay, and that's getting into my first point, and you can read right there, it's believed some historians that Illyrians were a combination of multiple tribes, true. Like the Daurus tribe, which I explained in my video on the top 50 facts about Bosnia, which if you haven't seen already, uh, you should definitely check out. Uh, I speak about the Illyrians as well. Now, the Illyrians arrived, I believe it was either the 7th or 8th century BCE, you know, before Christ. So they arrived in the area. They're an Indo-European tribe that arrived from somewhere from Eastern Europe and settled into the area where Neolithic people groups lived, of which we know even less about. Now, we call them the Illyrians because of this fact that it was the first tribe that really the Greeks noticed. One of the Illyrian tribes, you know, when the Greeks came over and said, hey, what's the, what's the name of your, you know, tribe when the Greeks asked them? And they were like, we are the Illyri tribe. So that's why we call them the Illyrians because the Greeks were the first tribe that contacted, that had contact with the Greeks were known as the Illyrian tribes. Well, every other uh, tribe had a different name. Like I say, the Daurus tribe or the Brautzi tribe. That's an, another tribe in Bosnia, Illyrian tribe that lived in today's Bosnia as well. So yeah, they were not one people group, as you can see, the Illyrians, very much uh, a mixture of many tribes. Sometimes they went to war with each other, so <laughs> that, that should further prove that no, they were not united, by not by any stretch of the imagination. 
However, when the area came under the control of the Byzantines, even the northern cities started to get more Hellenized. Now that we covered the cities, let's look at the countryside. What little of it was populated was mostly either by the descendants of retired Roman soldiers, which oftentimes at the end of their service were given land in the Balkan region, and or Illyrians, Thracians, Dacians, Greeks, and again some remnants of Germanic tribes. And even though this may seem like a lot of people, numbers wise it truly wasn't. There was also no clear predominant division between these farming settlements. It would be completely common to find valley with Illyrian farmers next to a valley of Germanic farmers next to two more valleys that were not settled. And this is uh, coming to my next point. Even if you look at Bosnia today or like uh, Montenegro today that has a lot of these valleys and mountains, still it's not homogenous. Even to this, it's not homogenous. Obviously, people have heard, you know, in Bosnia lived the Bosniaks, then the Serbs and the Croats, and they always kind of stick to like their own valley. Well, after the the war, you know, there are larger chunks of homogenous areas. But if you look at Bosnia before the war, very much what we're seeing here, kind of, it was a very mixed area. And if you look at, even to this day, it's pretty mixed. If you look at Montenegro, it also kind of proves that point. There are the, you know, Montenegrins, there are those that consider themselves closer to the Serbs, then there are the Bosniaks, then there are the Muslims, then there are the Albanians, you know, everybody in their own little valley. Because obviously with these valleys, they can't contact each other that easily as you can with a flat plane. Because if I wanted to walk from, let's say, here to go trade from here, I'd have to go like blah all the way around. That, that was just, you know, not worth it. I couldn't just go, you know, a lot shorter. I would have to actually travel quite a bit to get there. And building roads, especially back then on this kind of terrain very difficult. So you would just kind of stick to your own valley, your own little micro econo e economy. But if you're, you're, if you're on a flat territory, you can easily contact each other because, you know, flat, you can go, you can build roads a lot easier. You can move around a lot easier. And because of that, because more trade, more contact, uh, the, the area itself would sort of homogenize on its own. Now, if it's divided like this, there would be no homogenization because there's no contact between these people groups. So they couldn't create their own, like, you know, unique culture after a while. Everybody just sort of, you know, stuck to their own for a long time. It is also reasonable to assume so that it's true. these people intermingled in one way or another, creating a small but diverse population. Furthermore, the reason why the Balkans were so poorly settled and had a low economic development was because of its geography. As mentioned before, due to the mountainous and forested nature of the area and its location right next to the Pannonian Plain meant that many nomadic tribes could easily raid into the region and then quickly retreat before any kind of defense could be mounted as it took a long time to transport troops in the region. Now that we have a small understanding of the area, let's look at the Slavic migration into the Balkans. Prior to their main arrival in the 6th century, the Balkans suffered major raids from the Germanic and Hunnic tribes. We have written records stating that small towns were abandoned, roads were destroyed, and a large chunk of the population fled. The remaining people in the area lived in sizable fortified towns, which were mostly left... I was chuckling a little bit because it kind of reminds me of what's happening today. People are, you know, leaving and abandoning their village. It's like nothing that much has changed. Obviously, modern technology has, you know, benefited the Balkans, but not much. Still, people are, well, we're not getting raided, I guess, but we, this is still a place of, you know, instability of potential warfare. Because if you ask me what's more likely to go to war, Western Europe or like the Balkans, the Balkans probably would would most likely go to war with each other. I'm not saying that I want that. Of course, I don't want that. No. If you want war, that's just your sociopath. But uh, that just kind of goes to show like geography does matter. It really does. Where you're born, where you live, it, it does matter. And it does indeed uh, define your destiny. It's alone during the raids. It is possible that some Slavs came to the Balkans with these Germanic and Hunnic tribes as early as the 3rd century, but even with that it would be a very small percentage. The main wave of the Slavs came during the 6th century, continuing mm -hmm. into the 7th. The migration went either through the Lower Danube region, however due to a more direct Byzantine control of that area and the fact that it was more populated as it was largely spared during the raiding period meant that this wasn't a popular spot of crossing for the Slavs. That is why the majority of the Slavs probably went across the mountains. Moravian and Zeppelin passes into the Pannonian Basin or just across the, the mountains. mountains. 
Now it is important to understand that this Slavic migration didn't happen at once. It was more than a century long affair of migration with intertwined larger and smaller waves of settlers coming into the region. So why didn't the Byzantines stop the Slavs? Well, there are multiple reasons why Hard. the Byzantines <laughs> didn't protect the Balkans from the Slavic settlers, even though it was under their control. First, it was because the Slavs left the towns and cities alone, settling in the countryside that wasn't either populated in the first place or was abandoned due to the raids. This happened on such a large scale that Procopius and other writers mentioned that cities in the Balkans were like islands in a Slavic sea. So to the Byzantines, there was nothing really to protect since the Slavs were taking up area that was empty in the first place. The um... Now, it's not to say that they were just completely cool with each other, the Byzantines and the Slavic tribes. Uh, you'll probably get into that later. But what I wanted to mention to, uh, is the uh, the migration of Slavs into the Balkans. Now, there's many theories as to why this happened in the first place. One of them is that they simply saw an opportunity. You know, the Roman Empire was falling. Obviously, the Roman Empire fell in the 5th century. They noticed that nobody was protecting the border. There's no border guards anymore because the Roman Empire, you know, collapsed. Nobody's paying the border guards anymore. They went home and they're like, Let, let's go. Let's go farm the land. Now, they didn't go all at once. They, they didn't, you know, get on Facebook and everything, start a group and then just, you know, uh, um, s decided to settle an area. They didn't get together and decided, you know, everybody, just let's just go. Let's go into it. It was little by little. They noticed that, you know, People are benefiting from it. They're just, they, they can freely settle the territories. They were like, okay, let's go. That's the first uh, theory, the boring one. You know, just they saw free real estate, basically. The second one, which is more interesting, is uh, that they were forced downward due to the Avaric invasions. For those who don't know, they were like, I think they were either a Turkic or a Iranic tribe. I'm not sure. I got, I got to look that up. The Avars. But basically, they were fleeing from the Avars that were, you know, a nomadic tribe similar to like the Mongols or something. They wanted to, you know, f go to safety. And a lot of these who were seeking safety uh, had decided, you know, go into the Balkans in the mountainous Balkans where, you know, the Avars can't get you that easily on horseback. So that's the second theory. So first theory is economic migrants, as we see today, you know, people take an opportunity and settling like Germany or something. And the second uh, theory is that they had no choice, either run or die from the Avars. So that's the other theory. And uh, oops, let me do that. This also meant that some Byzantines were happy with the Slavs as they were rebuilding and yeah, resettling nice the area Definitely. that was destroyed before. Second reason why the Byzantines didn't stop the Slavs was because during much of the early Slavic migration, Justinian was busy reconquering Italy. And even if they had some free armies to fight the Slavs, Procopius writes that it was almost impossible as if the Byzantines defeated or made a pact with one tribe, the arrangement In was valid another. for just one small group and had no effect on any other tribe. The Slavic disunity can be seen in the various ways they settled the Balkans. The first wave of the Slavs were mostly peaceful settlers minding their own business, but after them in the 560s, Slavic tribes living outside of the Byzantine Empire held frequent yearly raids that went as far as northern Greece. And since there were already some Slavs living in the Balkans, it was obvious that many Slavic tribes didn't care much for each other fighting between themselves as often as fighting against others. These yearly raids culminated during the 570s. Nothing has changed. <laughs> when Avars came to Central Europe and started to solidify oh, their rule the over the Slavic tribes and the area. As such, the Slavs that were still living on the border with the Byzantine Empire held much larger raids into the Balkans than before. We have an account of one of these raids by John of Ephesus, but we know there were more raids than just one. These raids were different than the ones prior to this. First, because they were much larger, involving hundreds of thousands of people, and second, after the raiding stopped, instead of going back to the Avar-controlled territory, the Slavs just stayed at the Balkans. The Avars, not wanting to be left out from all the raiding, also started to raid the Balkans, including the newly settled Slavs. All of this was possible at the time because they come the again. army was fighting the Again, it was just a theory the that I mentioned. There were basically no soldiers left to protect the western regions of the empire. When the Persians war ended in 591, Emperor Maurice finally could address the Avar and Slavic problem. 
In the year 600, he managed to drove out the Avars along with some of the Slavs, but the majority of them have already settled into a farming life in the area, at this point numbering hundreds of thousands if not millions. And even though the Byzantines tried the age-old Roman tactic of resettling tribes throughout the empire, sending some Slavs to Anatolia and even the Caucasus, That's it didn't interesting. prove effective as these were small numbers compared to the actual Slavic population of the Balkans at this point. During the 7th century, as the wars between the Avars and Byzantines continued, so did the constant flow of Slavic people fleeing the Avar Khanate and settling into the Balkans. The north now being almost completely Slavic, and the south starting to get more and more settlements. There were even some accounts of Slavs trying to raid and settle Greek islands. It was also during this time that many cities and towns which held out, like islands, to Slavic assimilation started to be slowly quote-unquote converted. Now, it is important to note that even though some of these towns were militarily conquered, most of them were just peacefully assimilated over time into the much larger Slavic population. It is also important to recognize that during this time there was lots of fighting and power gramming in the Balkans. So even though the recognized area of Byzantine control was this, there were lots of autonomous areas, some of which still saw themselves as part of the empire, some of which didn't, some of which were subdued by the Byzantines, some of which were not, and then add the Avars for even more complications. So the Balkans were in this constant flux of uncertain political control by various groups, but by far the Byzantines usually ended up having the upper hand in the end. Now, what really set apart the Slavs and other groups that tried to settle the area, like Hunnic peoples tried to settle the area, and obviously, you know, like Avars, Mongols, and their rule is usually very short-lived because, one, they're nomadic, meaning that they don't really farm the area. They, you know, do what a nomad does, moves around a lot, leaves the place, um... You know, and their numbers are always low because the only way humans got you know such large numbers that that why humans are so dominant today is because we farm food. It's a lot more calories than going going out hunting or gathering. So their numbers were always low. They were very good warriors, the nomads, especially back in the day. But because they didn't have very good farming techniques, that their numbers were all always low, and they would get either assimilated or they would just you know, die out. There would be a, a brutal winter. There's no hunting animals. They would just you know, die out after a while. Now, the Slavic people, uh, even before this, they were farmers. They weren't completely nomadic. They were sort of a semi-nomadic tribal confederacy of sorts. Uh, they would use the slash and burn method, meaning after they finished, you know, uh, farming an area, they would slash and, you know, harvest it and then burn it and then move to another area. So it's kind of like nomadic and uh, a sedimentary as well. Did I use the right word? Like they remained at one spot technically just to farm it, but afterwards they would leave to go farm another plot of land. That's kind of what they were doing uh, in Eastern Europe where they're originated from for the longest of time. So they did have good farming techniques and, you know, the climate in the Balkans is still, you know, pretty cold, similar to what uh, you would have in Eastern Europe, and uh, so they they found it easy to settle this area. So they had everything they had to make their numbers very high and to keep them high, unlike other nomads. So, as as with the Huns and the Avars, they died out. The Slavs did not die out, thanks to their farming techniques. Okay. The Balkans now almost completely settled by the Slavs formed the dialect continuum. This means that even though we are certain the numerous Slavic tribes had many different dialects, they still can understand each other. And even though this Bosnian, still exists Serbian, in a Croatian form to this day, there are clear differences from the one now to the one in the early 7th century. One of these changes to this continuum was the arrival of the Croats and the Serbs. They arrived around the oh, <laughs> 7th century to find numerous Slavic tribes already living in the Balkans. So where the Croats and Serbs came from is very much still debated. We know for sure they came from the lands north of the Danube as this is where all the Slavs in the Balkans came from. How are the specifics of why they decided to come to the Balkans and how they managed to become so prominent in a sea of many different Slavic tribes is still largely unknown. The likeliest origin is that the Serbs 
Serbs and Croats, just as many other Slavic tribes, were under the Avar control going into the 7th century. They didn't use the commotion and the Khanate's instability during the Samos independence war to migrate into a more favorable area and the Balkans. This theory is supported by the fact that the formation of Samos kingdom correlates with the dates of our presumed understanding of Serbian and Croatian arrival into the Balkans. It is also very much possible that this wasn't just a single one-off migration by these two groups and the trickle of Serbian and Croatian people continued into the 8th and 9th century. Once the two tribes established themselves, they quickly started to influence the people around them, which can be seen today by the fact that the people in the area speak a variation of the Serbo-Croatian language. Also during this time, some of the people in this area migrated northwest into today's Slovenia. Here they found western Slavic tribes from Moravia which came to the area during the first Slavic wave in the 6th century. However, more waves may have occurred all the way till the fall of Samos Empire. This mix of Slavic tribes resulted in a unique Slovenian culture and language which today is isn't either Western Slavic nor Serbo-Croatian. This area was at start controlled by the Byzantines, then conquered by the Avars, and briefly vassalized by Samos Kingdom. But when Samo died, large part of the area fell back to the Avars. Nonetheless, a small county, Karantania, managed to remain independent partly due to the natural mountainous protection and partly due to the Frankish influence in the area. Then in 745, being threatened by the Avars and most likely pressured by the Bavarians, the county first became part of Bavaria and then annexed by the Carolingian Empire along with the lands lost to the Avars after the death of Samo. During the 8th century, Byzantines, Croats, Serbs and Avars all had some sort of political power match within today's Serbo-Croatian area. However, due to the unreliable and sparse written records, there's nothing we can say for certain about this area during this time. It is most likely that during the struggle, the Serbs and Croats established some political autonomy, but the extent of that autonomy is unknown. Nevertheless, we can presume that the Serbian Vlastimirovic dynasty was established and the precursor to the Croatian duchies of Pannonia and Dalmatia may have started to form shape. Although this wouldn't have been actual duchies as feudalism still wasn't in the area. They would have been more of a coalition of tribes trying to fight for autonomy against the Avars, Byzantines and other surrounding tribes. But while all of this was happening, there was another group which shaped South Slavic history and one we have more reliable sources about. The Bulgars were a coalition of nomadic Turkic tribes originating somewhere from Central Asia. Over time, this group also absorbed some Iranian, Hunnic and other Indo-European people, but their lifestyle remained very much nomadic. During the early 7th century, they inhabited the area of today's eastern Ukraine, but were under the control of the Avars. That also uh, to further prove that uh, the Bulgarians uh, went westward and somewhere in Russia, I can't remember where, there's literally a city called Bulgar. It's, it's not that large. It's like 40,000 people. I guess it's a town then. But a town in Russia that's still known as Bulgar from wh when the Bul Bulgarian people originally uh, settled the area, still to this day known, known as Bulgar started to change when the Avars and Sassanids made an anti-Byzantine alliance. The Romans, feeling threatened, quickly started to look for allies of their own. They made friends with the powerful Bulgar Dulo clan, and as a sign of friendship, the clan sent some of its children to the Byzantine court. One of these children was Kubrat, who was said to be a quick learner and had great admirations for the Byzantines. While at the Roman court, Kubrat was said to have converted to Christianity before returning back home. Once Kubrat returned, he used what he learned from the Romans and managed to unite the other Bulgar tribes under one banner, promising to free them from the Avars. Then presumably during the Byzantine Sassanid War, when Avars were busy raiding the Balkans, Kubrat rebelled and won. Quickly after this victory, he solidified his power and became the ruler of what we call Great Bulgaria. Continuing on, Great Bulgaria and the Byzantines had a close relationship and Kubrat's reign was very prosperous for the Bulgarian people. He eventually died around 650s and 60s, leaving the kingdom to his sons. With their distrust of each other combined with the Khazar aggression, the brothers divided up the kingdom and led their people to settle different areas within Europe. One of these brothers, Asparu, who traveled along the Black Sea, quickly came into a dispute with the Byzantines. After a few battles, the most decisive one being the Battle of Hongzal, he managed to win and settled the area of Lower Danube in 681, which is regarded as the foundation year of modern Bulgaria. A few years later, another brother of As- And for those wondering, uh, no, Bulgarians were... It's unknown what they were, but they were definitely not a Slavic tribe. Yeah, believe it or not, Bulgars originally not really Slavic. They were either a, a Turkic tribe originating from Central Asia or 
or some other Uralic tribe. That's also another theory. It's uh, Uralic, Turkic, somewhere from Central. We don't know exactly where they came from. So that's one thing. Second of all, this further proves my my point that nomads really weren't good at you know state building, as they were you know not really good at farming and stuff. So those that were good at farming, like the Slavs, usually dominated the culture of the area. And today's Bulgaria, you know, although not originally Slavic, more or less has a Slavic culture and a Slavic. So. Asparu Kuber, who first went to the Pannonian Plain and became an Avar vassal, rebelled and migrated with his I'll people check. to an area of modern-day Macedonia. Here, after a few battles, he became a North Macedonian vassal around the end of the okay. 1980s. And this is where all written records about Kuber and his people end, presumably settling and assimilating into the local population. This population being overwhelmingly Slavic. In fact, the Slavic population and the land settled by the Bulgars was so numerous that after just two centuries, the Bulgar land language died off and what remains to this day is a bulgaro macedonian slavic language what the yeah. bulgars managed the original to achieve bulgar in the language next two centuries different. is impressive and could easily have its own video in a very brief way they established Dang, the first bulgar empire <laughs> and even though it had some setbacks on occasion with some internal strife they managed to expand into much of southeastern europe by the 9th century they accomplished this through carefully crafted diplomatic actions, numerous military victories, and expansion into the former of our territory. This meant that Bulgaria stretched from the Black Sea to Pest, from the Dniester to the Ionian Sea. But Bulgaria had a problem. It was still pagan in an increasingly Christianized world. Boris I knew that converting would result in far better diplomatic relations, but he was already afraid of the increasing Byzantine influence in his realm. So his first idea was to convert to Roman Catholicism rather than Eastern Orthodox. However, this brief flirt with Catholicism didn't last because in 864, Boris lost the war with the Byzantines and in the peace treaty agreed to convert to Eastern Orthodox along with his people. Naturally, no one was happy, as Boris didn't want the increased Byzantine influence over Bulgaria and the Bulgarian Bulgarian people didn't want to change from their pagan beliefs. But Boris had a plan in mind. He quickly suppressed the rebellious populace and then invited the exiled disciples of Cyril and Methodius, which were no longer welcomed in Moravia. He then ordered them to translate the Greek liturgy into Old Bulgarian using the Glagolitic alphabet. This way, Boris could expel the Greek priests and replace them with his own Bulgarian priests, all while not breaking the treaty. The clerics quickly got to work, but Glagolitic proved not ideal for Old Bulgarian, and so the new Cyrillic alphabet based off of the older Glagolitic was created. From there, Cyrillic quickly Sweet. spread through the Glagolitic. Slavic Orthodox lands, replacing Glagolitic as the main Slavic alphabet. Although there were some continuous remnants of the use of Glagolitic all the way till the 19th century, mainly in Croatian church services. The Bulgarian Golden Age wouldn't however last forever. First, the Magyar arrived in the 10th century, threatening the Bulgarian borders. Second, the new powerful Kievan Rus started to take much Bulgarian trade and influence. And lastly, the continuous Byzantine hostility all culminated in the Bulgarian vassalization by the Byzantines in the early 11th century. Going back to the end of the 8th century in the Serbo-Croatian region, we are starting to gain more sources which is correlated with the arrival of Franks and Christianity into the region. We learn of Vyacheslav of Serbia, the first reliable mention of a ruler of the Serbian Vlastimirovic dynasty starting in around 780 and was most likely overseen in one way or another by the Byzantines. We also learn of Vyacheslav of well, Croatia, or more precisely Dalmatia, who lived around the same time and is most well known for his early attempt of trying to convert Dalmatia to Christianity and his eventual defeat <clears throat> at the hands of the Franks, after which Croatian Dalmatia became part of the Frankish Empire. Now, if you're wondering what's up with the modern-day Bosnia here, now, true, yeah, some parts of Bosnia were controlled by uh, the Serbs and Croats at one point, but it was only really nominally, like the Slavs in the area that were already there, as you saw in the video, there were already Slavs there, you know, kind of accepted their rule, but kind of didn't, like it was very difficult to tax them, to do anything with them, to hold on to them militarily, because Bosnia is... I would go ahead and say like the most mountainous area or the most rugged area, at least of, in all of the Balkans is a very difficult area to traverse. So everything was nominal only in Bosnia, like Bosnia was Catholic, but only nominally, like most people like didn't really hold on to their beliefs that long. So what the Croats and Serbs held on to was, you know, a re Slavic people of, of Slavic descent, of course, that lived there. 
but it was very nominal at the time. And afterwards, the Bosnian Banate will start expanding from uh, the c- center of Bosnia today, Visoko, and uh, it would expand all, all around. And we get the modern day country of Bosnia. It was basically Slavs ruling over other Slavs. So Serbs were ruling over other Slavs, uh, Croats were ruling Slavs, and the Bosnians were ruling s- Slavs. It was basically about power at that at that point. And Croatia and Pannonia became a vassal. So at the beginning of the 9th century, the area kind of looked like this, with the Slavic lands being ruled by Slavic rulers, but overall very much under the sphere of influence by the two major powers. At least until the of it became well, Duke of yeah. Pannonia in 810. He was raided by the Frankish Duke of Friuli, and after the Emperor Louis the Pious decided not to punish the Duke, enraged Ludovic rebelled in 819. He quickly started to recruit allies, most notably from the Slovenian Carantania. After making some initial gains, this looks like a Holy Roman the Empire. Frankish King, the thing. Duchy of Friuli, <laughs> and the Croatian Dalmatia, which was now ruled by Brona, the successor of Vyacheslav of Dalmatia, Boy. proved to be overwhelming for Ludovic, who lost in 822 and escaped to the Serbian lands. He was welcomed by the successor of Vyacheslav of Serbia, Radoslav, but Ludovic had different plans. He killed Radoslav and tried to take control of Serbia. What exactly happened after that, we don't know, but presumably it didn't go well as Ludovic in 823 escaped to Croatian Dalmatia, now ruled by Ludomisl. But Ludomisl, just as his predecessor Brona, was loyal to the Franks and so he promptly killed Ludovic, ending the Croatian rebellion. With that, the Frankish rule over Croatia was solidified, and the Croatian-Serbian border became the divide between the Frankish sphere of influence. Thanks, so Franks. The hold on, sphere of hold on to parts of Bosnia. Kind of seen today in the division of religion and alphabet of the Balkans. Later on in Croatian Dalmatia, Trpimir I, who established the Trpimirovic dynasty that ruled Croatia until 1091, would success. And like right in these fractured uh, zones of control, would Bosnia would <clears throat> spring well. Would it be counted as early South Slavic history? Because Bosnia appeared, uh, you know, a little bit afterwards. So it wasn't really, it was like more like medieval South Slavic history, I guess. But <clears throat> Bosnia would appear in this fracture line, basically. That's kind of how Bosnia was born in, in, in the middle of everything. Like not really uh, Catholic or Eastern Orthodox and, uh, you know, not really controlled by Croatia or Serbia. And you would get... Bosnia was spring forth. So he gained autonomy by playing the Byzantines and Franks off of each other. However, the recognized autonomous kingdom of Croatia wouldn't be established until the Dalmatian annexation of Croatian Pannonia in 924-25. It was also during this time that Catholic church influence in the area solidified and pagan practices overall ended in Croatia. In Serbia, on the other hand, the succession crisis caused by Ludovic was quickly solved by Vlastimir, who consolidated his power in Serbia around the 830s, but still remained under the influence of the Byzantines. He was also faced with the problem of Bulgar advancement towards the Serbian lands, but against all odds defended his realm, supposedly with no Byzantine help. During the rest of his reign, Vlastimir consolidated his power and managed to gain Serbian independence from the Byzantines. How exactly he did that, we have no written sources about. After his death in late See what I mean? 40s, we didn't write Stalin much. started a long succession war which was won by Mutimir. Mutimir went on to oversee even more successful campaigns against the Bulgars and also nice the Christianization <laughs> of the country into the Eastern Orthodoxy. And even though there's countless of events I could talk about going on. Uh, uh, history at, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Serbia at this time, you know, wasn't completely, you know, after this, Serbia wasn't completely uh, Eastern Orthodox, there were still a lot of, you know, Catholics in the area. And obviously you see all those mountains are probably a bit of pagans as well. But after St. Saba came back, you know, from Greece and from meditating or whatnot, then he really officially, you know, uh, it decided to make the, the state religion Eastern Orthodoxy for Serbia. So yeah, search him, search him up, St. Saint, Saint Sava, he's a very important saint in Serbian history. And from here, or address your comments of why I didn't talk about white Croatia or white Serbia, which are just foundation myths, I will leave it off here. With Bulgars starting their golden age and ruling over their Macedonian brothers, the Serbs finally independent from the Byzantine rule, Croatians free from the Frankish sphere of influence. Bosnia comes a little later. Well, under German control for a long time. This is not to say that all these lands were just Slavic at this point. There were still most likely some remnants of Roman, Illyrian, Pagans. German, etc. settlements. However, compared to the bigger overall picture, they were a small speck in the Balkan Slavic political sphere. Please consider subscribing. And... Okay, yeah, that was the end of the video. So 
That was a very good video. I like that video because I love videos about history and Slavic history, especially. There's a lot I could say more. I will do some more reaction videos to like uh, Slavic history, history specifically. But uh, one thing I wanted to add is uh, another way we know that uh, the people groups of Europe were very united. And I'm going to end off on this, on the gods of thunder. Like I, I always ask myself this. Uh, if you notice in <clears throat> Greek mythology, the head honcho of the gods is Zeus, god of thunder and lightning. I was like, okay, they thought thunder and lightning, you know, main god, whatever. But then I, if you notice Nordic mythology, what is the head honcho? Well, he's not the main god, but he's the most powerful god in Nordic mythology. The main god is technically <clears throat> Odin, but Thor is the most powerful god. And what is he the god of? Right, the god of lightning and thunder. I was like, oh, that's probably just a coincidence, you know, whatever. But then you take a look at Slavic early Slavic mythology, uh, the main god in Slavic mythology is Perun, P-E-R-U-N, Perun. And what is he the god of? He is, yeah, the god of lightning and thunder. So I'm thinking like at this point, that just, that just can't be a coincidence. Like those three had very little contact with each other, very little in common with each other, yet they still have like the main god being the god of thunder. And apparently the the idea is that, yeah, that's further proof that Indo they are all descendants of the Indo-European tribe because it's assumed, only assumed, we, had, we don't have confirmation, but it's assumed that the Indo-European main god was in fact a god of thunder. <clears throat> and then the stories changed a little bit as they, you know, settled different areas, the Greeks uh, down there, the Slavs over there, and the Nords all the way up there. And they change their stories up a bit after after time because it's, you know, mouth to mouth storytelling uh, gets more and more different over time because obviously you can't remember exactly how it goes. So over time, it becomes slightly more and more different. And uh, <clears throat> they all came up with their own, you know, mythologies. But still, it was the God of Thunder that was the head God. Uh, that is very interesting. So I'll end off on that. Uh, thank you all for watching. And as always, take care.